It's now time for this month's broadcast of Learning Now TV. the January edition of Learning Now Television. It's probably a bit late in the month to say Happy New Year, but I'm, I'm going to put it out there anyway. I hope you all had a lovely festive break and we are kicking off 2023 in style. Nigel, who have we got on the show? Well, let me say Happy New Year as well. And particularly, Happy New Year to you, Kate. For, and we'll have a great 2023. Who have we got on the programme? Um, it's very interesting. We've very varied... Uh, program this time and I, I'm really like that I think that's what we should be aiming for first person up uh, Vikas Joshi Vikas is the CEO of Harbinger Group which is an edtech company based in Pune in India and Redmond in California so he commutes between India and the US west coast but what he's doing that is interesting he's not just telling us about Harbinger Group he's talking about what he sees as the fundamental transformation of the edtech market um, over the last few years. So he's really insightful, very nice guy. I've known him for a number of years. Secondly, we've got um, Andy Lancaster from CIPD talking to our good friend and uh, mentor and ever-present figure, Robin Hoyle. So a conversation between Robin Hoyle and Andy, plus Joe Cook. I talked to Joe Cook, and Joe has released some research on basically online facilitation, the goods, the bads, the frustrations, the things that go well, the things that don't go so well. Really, really worth listening to Joe. Mrs. Enthusiasm as well. You know, I get such a lot out of Joe. And incidentally, Kate, while we were doing the interview, you said, no, no, Nigel, just turn this here. No, no, put that light there. No, no, that's wrong with it. She gave me all these tips and she was right. She, she got, before, so I, I got a huge advantage of the Joe Cook light bulb moment before we'd even, we'd even open our mouths. free consultancy there, yeah. Exactly, free consultancy. And then there's Rob Clark with his regular news bulletin talking about Credit Suisse and Kineo Learning Technologies Team of the Year, just talking about what they did to win that. And Fosway, their realities in HR research that came up before Christmas. So it's a pretty, pretty good programme. What do you think? Well, I've yeah, I've you know close to that research. They partnered with us on that Fosway. Um, really, always love to hear the story behind the story from the awards. You know, that's the the, the kind of the phrase that I use to describe it. So, really keen to watch it all, and hope you all enjoy. Yeah, enjoy it. Enjoy the show. I'm really thrilled. Genuinely thrilled to introduce Vikas Josi, who is the CEO of Harbinger Group, which is a learning technology company based in Pune, India. And I've known Vikas for very many years, and he's actually Dr. Vikas yeah. Joshi, because um, Vikas completed the Penn CLO program, completed his doctorate, many years ago, and he actually won an award for his doctorate. It was an exceptional piece of research that he did. So to catch up with him after a number of years is always an enormous pleasure. So welcome, Vikas. It's really lovely to see you again and be able to talk to you again. It's my pleasure, uh, Nigel. Great to be uh, with you and uh, good, good to meet you. Uh, we go back a long way uh, from we the do. time we met in uh, UPenn and even before. Uh, so it's great to yes. be uh, great to be together again. Yes, and both of us have been on a journey. Your company has been on a journey, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But you wrote an article in CLO magazine, uh, which came out in September, so very recent, and it talks yeah. about the future of learning, preparing your L and D organization for the new landscape of work, which is a very interesting portmanteau title and i'm going to slightly tease it apart 
and ask you, first of all, what is the new landscape of work? How do you see work evolving from your perspective? Uh, that's a great question. Um, when I think about the new landscape of work, I like to think in somewhat broader terms. Um, there are things that are changing. And as we know, some of the highlights over the past few years include the pandemic, the supply chain shortages, the war in Europe, and the economic turmoil due to inflation in advanced economies and the labor shortages. To me, these are singularities. They are event that, events that occur, everybody talks about them, there's a big impact, and then you move on, and then the next thing happens. But underlying these singularities are certain definitive directions, there are certain trends, things going in a certain way that surface because of the singularities. They are there beneath the surface, but the singularities serve to accentuate them. And then you sort of get up and say, hey, you know what, people are going to work from home. Or you know what, this generation is different, their priorities are different. So you begin to see the underlying trends um, sooner and they become more salient because of the singularities. So if you go to the underlying trends, what you see is in the developed world, and this is again interesting because I have one foot in India and one in the United States. And so I have this, uh, this unique opportunity to develop a pers perspective that is quite, quite interesting because I contrast the, the demographic um, you know, uh, situation in the two places, right? So in the Western economies, what you see is the workforce needs to produce more and more per person to sustain and grow the broader economy because there's always going to be a shortage relative to the total population of working age individuals and it's not growing as fast as in developing economies. And so you're gonna to have to have a major push toward automation, digitization. Those are the things that are gonna come in a big way and it's already panning out. What that does is it creates efficiencies. At the same time, it opens skill gaps. Uh, think of it this way, you automate driving and so you need a driver less, but then you need an autonomous vehicle algorithm designer more. So you need newer skills, you need different capabilities, and these skill gaps open up and they morph as you go. And so work is changing from that perspective. You know, we are in a skill economy. That's a major uh, new direction. The other major new direction is that the crew has now different preferences. People want to work from home. So there's there's this big remote work, work from home, hybrid work environment, which has upended the traditional HR processes. So how do you manage performance? How do you onboard people? All of that is changing as well. So the skill economy and remote work are the two sort of major underlying trends that outline what's happening in the work. Can I just talk to you about the skill economy? How do you define that? Everyone is talking about the skill economy, but to me, if you have a skill economy, you, you are not defining jobs. Jobs become less important than collections <laughs> of skills. Uh, jobs become less important than projects that require skills. Uh, departments become less important than people gathering together to work on a particular problem or a particular project uh -huh. and then going coming together again. Do you see the skill economy as a as a massive shift? You know, not just a, oh we're, we're interested in skills, but to have to rethink the very structures of the workplace. Precisely, I think it's 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 almost like a marketplace for skills, right? So you you need to dynamically compile teams that could get things done within an organization and across organizations. So we see a lot of that. Yes, that's that's yes. what is going on. 
Good. Indeed. Right. Let's let's shift to learning then. Now, a, a, com- a conventional learning and development operation, as we are very familiar with, doesn't cut that, does it? It just doesn't get anywhere near meeting the accelerating needs of organizations. It doesn't deal with that kind of split, hybrid, more complex workforce. And it certainly doesn't deal with complex patterns of work. So where do you see, le- how will learning adjust? Where do you see learning adjusting? Uh, the simplest way I can put it is, you know, there's there's a there's a complete reimagination of learning and development that's that's needed because work and learning are so entwined that you cannot have work change and evolve and learning remain where it is. You just can't have that. And it's so, the end of learning, isn't it? If that happens, Vikas, if if L and D mm-hmm. digs in its heels and say we're going to do the same old, same old, there won't be L and D. Would you? I, I, I'd make that statement. Would you agree? Uh, I, I I totally do. I totally do. And as you know, as someone who has handled large, you know, L and D portfolios in the past, um, you would you would have seen that shift. Uh, that's quite evident now. Um, I think uh, the, the reimagining of learning has, has several components in it. Um, the most important, um, I would say, boil down to three basic fundamental principles. Number one is people are not going to show up for learning. Learning has to show up at work. Um, And and let me sort of uh, go a little bit deeper into that. Uh, What I mean by that is you have to find where the learner is, and the learner is usually at work, and you have to go and introduce learning there. You know, the learner lives in Teams or Slack or Salesforce. Uh, Learning has to occur inside those environments and within the context of a specific workflow or a specific work objective or a specific performance objective. And so learning in embedded within the context of work and uh, you know, learning that makes sense at the point at which you're working uh, becomes very critical. That's, that's one important piece of it. So I, I've been talking to a company in Europe that's big on in-app learning. So they are investing in, in building in-app learning modules that are not just about, you know, hey, here's a tutorial, here's how, how you use these menus, but it's more about here's what you can make, you know, here's how you can imagine the use of this product in specific use cases. So the experience of getting better at your job is embedded into the usage of the product. And that's that's where this needs to go. And I can I see it going in this direction. Yes. yes. The second piece has to do with the design of learning. Um, the, the guiding paradigm for learning design over the past couple of decades has been the instructional design in which you start with learning objectives and learning content, and then you design, you know, step by step, how you want to advance the learner through the journey, almost without regard to technology. Technology comes as an afterthought. Uh, This is not going to work anymore. Now the technology has to be the foundation of learning design. Let me explain. It's like if you were to write a script for a movie, you had better know what the technology for movie making is because then that's how you would you know write out the shots and what happens and so on and so forth right so without a clear awareness of the affordances of technology for learning you're not going to be able to design good learning so this is something that instructional designers will have to keep in mind and they would have to know how they are going to you know, steep the learning experience within um, the technological affordances. I think that's absolutely right. Yes. yes. And is there a third one? Yeah, there is. And the third one has to do with this classic need for putting the learner in the center without losing the direction, right? So, Learner-centric yet sufficiently guided. 
And, and learners want to be in the center because they want the learning to be personalized. They want to have the initiative to learn something or not something else at a given point in time. They want to have a choice over whether to watch an entire video or to skim through it, whether to answer questions or to simply view flashcards. They need to be able to take those decisions. At the same time, you want them to reach a certain level of competency and outcomes. And for that to happen, there needs to be some guidance. So this balance between, between keeping it learner-centric yet outcome-oriented is something we would need to increasingly foreground in the coming days. Yes. Final question. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? How do you see this manifesting itself? Do you think we will give up? Or do you think LD will kill itself? Uh, will commit suicide by just not integrating or do you see a, a rosy future for organizations and for and for learning in organizations well for 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 an entrepreneur uh, one thrives on turmoil confusion uh, one thrives on opportunity to create value and I don't think there was a better opportunity for create value than there is today for the learning and development organization. Mm -hmm. Today, the chief learning officer has a seat at the table unless they come in the way. You know, uh, organizations are absolutely desperate to build the kind of skills they would need, even to keep the boat steady. You know, uh, let alone advance it. And there's such a dire shortage, and you can't just go out and hire. You have to get committed to building it within the organization. So there is skill building within the organization. There is alignment of people to organizational objectives. There is integration between HR and learning processes. And there is, quite frankly, analytical insights in the workforce that would help the leadership um, design the right interventions, all of which is a mandate of the chief learning officer. And the technology vendors and content vendors are there to support them. Uh, they just have to make sure that they emphatically put forward the need for drawing the line between strategy and learning. I think it's very important now. And so I, yes. I'm super excited to be, to be in this space. Um, I've served the needs of organizations in learning and technology for 32 years now. I, I can't remember the time when I was more excited than I am today. That's a fantastic note to end on. Bikas, Joshi, thank you so much for sharing your insights and painting a complicated and uh, demanding, but nevertheless, really exciting future. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Growing your people can get pretty messy. But degreed learning experience makes it neat by giving your workforce the flexibility to learn when, where and how they want and giving you the power to guide their growth so you can solve today's challenges while building the skills to take on tomorrow. I really can't get through 12 months without a virtual hug from Jo Cook. I just need her enthusiasm her knowledge and her skills just to keep me going through to the next 12 months. And this is my shot. This is my opportunity to talk to Jo. Jo is the founder of Lightbulb Moment. She's also an online learning, I would say guru. She calls herself expert. She really knows about this stuff. And what we're going to talk about is a research report that was commissioned by her and she did with Jane Daly. And it's called Amplifying the Human Focus in Virtual and Hybrid Learning, which is a great title, Amplifying the Human Focus. So we're not going to be rambling on about technology and which buttons you push. We're going to be talking about human beings, something I'm much more interested in and I'm sure Joe's much more interested in. So, first of all, welcome, Joe. It's really lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. Good. I'm glad. I hope you're still saying that at the end. And the second question, or the second statement, is a bit more uh, to the point. What, why did you 
get involved in this research? What drove you to to do it? Jane and I had uh, a very long lunch one day, and as you do when you're having these kind of meetings, we rambled on about various things and moaned and postulated. And we got to the point of thinking, well, obviously we need to do something if we're moaning and postulating. And there was perhaps a, a lack of research around uh, virtual and hybrid learning. And there's, there's pockets of it and there's much more now than there was a few years ago. Also, what we really wanted to do was understand what was happening for our learners. Now, we absolutely know that there's a difference between what our learners would like us to do and what is right for their learning and for their performance needs. But we really wanted to understand, well, when we do a six hour virtual classroom where we talk at you and force you to have your webcams on all day, what does that do to you? Uh, and obviously it affects their well-being and all of those things. So we wanted to understand that element of it. We also wanted to hear from professionals about successes and challenges they were having, how they actually interact with people. And as you say, it's all about that focus on the human. There is a technology aspect of it, of course, but what we want to do is kind of almost transcend that and really focus on, well, how can we connect with people in a meaningful way to make it as close as an in-person experience as possible, whilst also capitalising on what we can do with virtual and hybrid experiences. And I guess that it would confirm your own insights from doing this day in, day out, but also you're putting on paper some of your best practice for the world. So essentially anyone who is involved in doing any kind of virtual presentation, it doesn't it doesn't need to be learning and development, it can be anything, any kinds of meetings, would be well advised to read this, read the research, learn and listen. Because, you know, you talk about four stages of, uh, of development and the first stage is pretty, pretty poor experience, I would argue. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the three perspectives are the learner perspective, the organizational perspective, and then the hybrid perspective. So one is to share best practice. The second is to help organizations succeed. And the final one is to avoid expensive mistakes. And I bet there are loads of them. So let's just go through and talk about the learner. What did you learn from this research? And what would you advise people to do that they don't, or pretty much you're certain that they don't do now? So one of the really clear things that came through from the learner perspective is that they want smaller class sizes. They want virtual classrooms with up to 10 people. And the reason for that is they then get the opportunity to interact. And that word opportunity is really important. We don't have to have everyone clicking and doing something every time, but we need people to be able to move from, hmm, to all and be able to get engaged and involved in that learning, have that experience. We know how important it is for remembering and recall and all of that other really good stuff. Also, what they're telling us is they know when there's a well-designed session. They might not know the difference between good and great or the nuances and the, the, all the different theories that we might employ, but they know when a session has not been designed well for live online. Yes. They know bloody so, awful. Oh, I need a cough, sorry. <laughs> Got a bit of a sinus infection. I'm sorry. That's all right. I, I'll so just repeat that. Uh, so, Joe, they know what bloody awful looks like. <laughs> Your word's not mine, but yes, they do. And they know when the facilitator doesn't know the technology. They get frustrated when the facilitator's talking too much. All of these things that we kind of know and we 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 kind of miss that a little bit at the beginning because we're focusing on the tech, fine. But we're now at a stage, especially kind of since the global pandemic, where we need to be focusing on performance and not just good enough emergency sessions. So there's obviously a lot more in the report, but that's some of the essence of the learner perspective. Yeah, it's really, it's really important. And you're right. I, I think that we were so relieved that when you press the button, there was there was video and everyone was there. We kind of gave up at that point. You know, that's the job done. But what you're saying, which is incredibly sensible and fairly obvious advice is that is just the beginning. You have to craft these experiences and make them as best you can and not just be so glad that the cameras came on and that people could connect 
and there's not oh can you hear me oh I'm, I'm on mute all those kind of trivial boring things which we should be a long long way past okay learn a perspective what about the organizational perspective talk about the organizations that you you discovered in your research so a lot of the challenges are around kind of that decision making that cultural element and that cultural element will impact things like well which technology can can i even use in my sessions am i allowed an external tool through to do we have time to develop these skills to actually go and rewrite our sessions so there's a lot of stuff here around the strategic direction for the design and delivery that's really important and then that moves us into, as he said, that hybrid um, element, because hybrid is a whole other beast and it's a digital first approach. It's not a kind of, well, we're doing this in-person thing and, oh, some people might be viewing it. That's a live stream. That's very different. That's fine. But a hybrid approach needs to be, right, we've got this digital design and we've got an in-person audience or one or more, and we've got an online audience of people from wherever. And how do we get an experience that is different for both of those audiences, but equal to an extent and actually joined and connected? And that's that amplification on, and that human focus that we're really looking at. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is that organisations should not be complacent. They should really craft and build and, mm. and look at what they're doing and do it critically so that they yeah. know that they can bet better and they take steps to get better, not just to be, oh, it works. That's all I need to worry about because that's a disaster. And what you're, what you're showing in the report is some of the human consequences of that disaster. People tired, bored, demotivated by feeble and, and attempts actually, to make it work. And actually it can really affect people's mental health. Yes. So um, yes. I did a podcast about this where we did a deep dive into a case study and this one person's experience got them to the point of thinking, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, maybe I need to leave my job. And that was all through basically poor quality virtual training. And that's not how it should be. Um, and we we absolutely understand there's time issues, there's resource issues, you know, money is tight these days. We absolutely get it. But within the context you're in, within the resources you have, what we're trying to do is make it so that people can do the best they can within that. And, you know, the report is free to download. It's, you know, as part Why of that. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't yeah. you, Joe? Why wouldn't you download it? Because it's full of really practical, evidence-based advice. And that's what I also want to emphasize. This is research. This is not Joe sitting in front of a, a blank screen and made, making it all up and saying, oh, my advice is, you've actually got the evidence to support every single claim that you make and every single piece of advice that you advocate. So all of that is extremely helpful and practical. And any organization using online facilitation of any sort, which is everybody, should read this report. So everyone should read it. There's no, there's no excuse. It's simple. Everybody should read this report. I just want to take you through the four stages that you mm -hmm. talked about, you know, the, the, the journey to hybrid learning. So the, the, the stage four is you, what you call the master stage. There's basic, intermediate, advanced and master. Let's just pick on master. What makes a master stage? What makes a master uh, a, a ability in all of this? Explain that quite clearly to us and differentiate it from the very basic. What is a master Master manipulator, master facilitator, I guess <laughs> a live on learn live learning specialist at yourself. What do they do different? So when you're at master level, it's um one of the things we say in the report is it's about clear advocation. So we're not just going, oh, we have to do it virtually. We're actually saying this is the right modality for this learning intervention. And then we're going to be very human led in that. So that design isn't about let's cram all this content in and oh, we can fit 100 people on our license, let's go for it. It's actually this session is best for six people. It's very discussion led, it's whatever it might be. We've got all the blended learning and resources, we've got the performance support, whatever that might be. 
The technology that is enabled and used is very stable and fluid is the term that we use. But basically, we're not playing with the technology anymore. It is tried and tested and trusted. And all of our staff know how to use it. But it goes beyond that into things like the strategy of how do I know what my performance needs to be in virtual design and delivery? And actually, one of the really scary things in our report was so few people said, I am actually measured against performance um, that I know and I know what that framework is. So we're at a stage with this where people are kind of going, well, I think I know what best practice is. But actually, that's not written down and I've got no idea and nobody actually marks me against it anyway. So that's the difference at master level is that you're putting all of that into practice from uh, the very first design through to the feedback and the performance mo model and measures yes. afterwards. So, it, so let me put it in a very technical way. It's a bit like falling out of bed online learning and getting up, getting showered, getting dressed, looking smart online learning that's that it's a kind of professional approach and being conscious that everything you need to do you can do better and you need to keep improving and you need benchmarks to keep doing that so joe this is really useful stuff and all i can say once more is if you haven't read this report and you're in any way involved in online learning facilitation online meetings you're simply crazy this is wonderful stuff joe cook master facilitator, guru of online learning facilitation. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigel. Upskill and inform your learners with Mind Tools for Business. Empower your people to thrive at work and help them step up and meet everyday workplace challenges with confidence. Our toolkit provides unlimited access to thousands of quality assured resources all in one place. It's easy to use and on demand anytime, anywhere. Experience stress-free onboarding with dedicated client partner support and get access to our library of industry insight and expert analysis. Perform, manage, lead with Mind Tools for Business. Visit mindtoolsbusiness.com to find out more. Next up, as ever, is Rob Clark from Learning News giving us his latest roundup. He's been busy talking to various different people about various different new initiatives across learning. So LearnOps is an operational framework that's set to bring new standards for how L&D teams work and succeed. I'm nerdily interested in standards, so that's actually quite exciting to me. Uh, Fosway's uh, HR Realities research that they did in partnership with Unleash, uh, some great data in there. I've had the privilege of, of, of digging into that a little bit. Um, and then finding out what it takes to win Learning Technologies Team of the Year from the horse's mouth, the 2022 gold winners, uh, Credit Suisse and Kineo and finding out a bit more about CLO 100 that we talked to Cathy Hoy about before Christmas. So quite a lot there from Rob. Talent shortages are now the top business challenge and HR is shifting its priorities to learning. We drill into Fosway's latest research. LearnOps, DevOps for L&D, an operational framework set to bring new standards for how L&D teams work and succeed. What does it take to win Learning Technologies Team of the Year? We'll find out with 2022 gold winners Credit Suisse and Kineo. There's a new program and qualification for Chief Learning Officers. CLO 100 starts this April. Co-creator Cathy Hoy is here. Talent shortages are now the most significant business challenge. Companies are struggling to recruit the people they need. And with job roles changing so quickly, there's even more pressure on reskilling existing employees. Each year, Fosway produces its HR Realities Research. It shows what HR is doing to meet this talent shortage, how its priorities are changing. Number one, being a learning organisation. Right? Again, that's a little bit of a... No, that seems a little bit different, but I think when you put it in the context of having to 
retain and attract and grow talent, grow skills. Actually, that is a really interesting maneuver, right? It's a a way that the the HR and organizations are responding to the, the, the dearth of talent or the lack of availability of talent. They're also prioritizing better leadership and management. So actually having the leaders who can um, create a climate where people want to stay and grow. Number five in the list uh, this year was reskilling and upskilling. And if you went back to 2021, that was number 10. If you look at improving employee retention, that's number seven this year. But go back last year, and it was number 16. And then facilitating digital transformation, so really upping the gear of the organization to operate in a more digitally modern way. That's gone to number seven from number 13. So there has been a, seems to be a realignment of priorities in HR, which is significant. When you hear the word learn ops for the first time, as I did recently, The first thing that comes to mind is perhaps DevOps and other business ops, operational frameworks, standards and strategies that unify best practice to improve the way organisations operate. The thought of a learn ops kind of already feels familiar, but no, learning operations frameworks and standards are actually for the most part new to us. Perhaps this is about to change, as an organisation called Cognota has been busy building a learn ops framework a technology to run it, and aligning itself with chief learning officer coaches to help implement it. Why is it that all these other business functions have operating models that are efficient, effective, and have technology to support it, but you know, L&D really just relies on the LMS and spreadsheets? As the demands on L&D increase and adapts from being sort of order takers into departments that are really adding value to their organizations. They need to have systems and frameworks and processes in place in order to deliver services the same as any other part of our organizations. And so we're helping to capture requests from the business, bring forward all the people who need to be a part of that project to actually collaborate on the right solutions and have better access to automation and to streamline processes, but also data that will help them make real-time decisions. Credit Suisse, along with Kineo, won Learning Team of the Year at the Learning Technologies Awards. The team worked seamlessly with suppliers and shifted from order takers to learning consultants. And long-term investments in impact data have changed the internal view of the team. We like to think of ourselves as creative connectors. So we're e-learning advisors. And as the name uh, suggests, we really advise our internal partners on all things digital learning solutions. Ongoing challenges really that we're constantly working on is really overall improving the quality of the e-learning. So we have a big mandatory pipeline. We have strategic e-learnings. People get a lot of learning. Um, But two things specifically, we've really tried to reduce the content consistently. So coming up with calculations as to what does it mean to have a 30-minute e-learning and how can we reduce that content across the board, um, which is not quite as easy as it sounds. Um, And also implementing things like test out to make sure that people get credit for what they already know and then spend less time in the e-learning. CLO 100 is a new development program for leaders in learning. It provides the skills and knowledge to improve performance and have the maximum impact in an organisation. And it does this by providing a safe space for heads of learning to challenge their thinking with like-minded peers and to develop new skills to take an organisation to the next level. CLA 100 is essentially a structured development program for leaders in learning. Um, regardless of your title, so whether you're a head of L&D, an L&D director, a uh, chief learning officer, essentially those people that are accountable for the L&D strategy in their organisation. Uh, the programme runs over 12 months and we cover six core topics in that time, spending pretty much two months on each topic. You learn to create a a really inclusive and and safe learning environment in your organization. You know, I I think we know that's something that's that's massively important, but it's talked about a lot in our industry at the moment. It will help people to uh, strategically align their learning strategy to the business goals um, and really how to demonstrate kind of impact and value uh, that they're bringing to the business as well. And probably as a as a side effect of that, also build a really close network of, of peers as well from different industries. 
That's learning news this January. In a few weeks' time, look out for a special programme on how learning and development might fare during these difficult economic times. A few well-known faces are going to help me unravel what the recession might have in store for this industry. See you next time. So you can see, this is just like using a whiteboard in a classroom. And then you do my three-year-old's favourite, you just have a nice little wiggle. One, two, three, rate it now. A really quick question, you might want to answer this later. You see, I love this. <laughs> To start off 2023 on Learning Now TV, I'm overjoyed to be joined by CIPD's Head of Learning and award-winning author of Developing Performance Through Learning, Andy Lancaster. Andy Lancaster, thank you for joining us again at Learning Now TV and uh, welcome to uh, a New Year's set of LNTV broadcasts. Great to be here. Um... Don't know where this conversation is going to go, but it's always nice to spend some time with you, Robin. So, let's, well, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're unpacking a bit on self-directed learning, so I'm looking forward to this. Absolutely. So we've seen, you know, with uh, I talk about the idea of pandemic premiums and, and the idea that there are certain things which happened within that the, the past two and a half years or so with, with COVID-19 and everything that have been absolutely dire and nobody's got a good word to say for them and rightly so. But there have been a few things within the world of work where change has happened, which has not necessarily been negative. And, and one of those has been around the shift in expectations of, of the people who work within organisations. What, what kind of impact has that had, do you think, that, that translates through to learning and development? I, th I think COVID has been an interesting one. There's always a tension between what the organisation wants and what the employee or staff needs and in one sense it's two sides of the same coin but what I think COVID has done has increased the the employee voice within organizations now obviously we see that in things like flexible working that staff now in in some sectors I'm obviously we've got to be sensitive not not everybody has this but there is the chance now for a greater employee voice and I think on learning it's just such a brilliant opportunity for us as learning professionals in the context of this cultural shift that we raise the voice of the, the learner and what the learner needs um, and dial down some of maybe what the organization requiring. And I think um, senior leaders understand this change in dynamic, that there is a greater balance to be had around what employee staff need and what the organization needs. So it's a brilliant time for us as, as learning professionals to really think through moving to a more self-directed model where learners have a greater say, a greater control, a greater input on how learning is undertaken in organisations rather than just taking what the organisation requires. And, you know, in, in your book, your award-winning book, I should say, Developing Thank you. Learning, you, you, you kind of presaged this because, of course, this was published and certainly written pre-pandemic. But you talk there around self-directed learning and and this the importance of of being clear about what it is. So just just share with us, if you will, the the idea about well, what is that self-directed learning? What does that mean in practice for individuals within organisations? Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's probably worth very quickly just saying that th there's a couple of terms that we sometimes can. Um, conflate into the same thing. So I think self-directed learning is where we allow a person to shape 
their learning journey, their, their learning approach. We've also got a thing called self-determined learning, which is where learners really control their learning. So I think it's important that we distinguish between those those two things. So self-directed, obviously, if you go back in the 1960s, Malcolm Null was very strong on this in terms of adults being involved in the planning um, and the evaluation of their learning, the whole thing about experiences being a really key to the learning process and and really that that relevance um, to the individual. So I think in most organizations, we're at a place now where self-directed learning is not only possible, it's absolutely essential. Self-determinated learning is, is a more of a challenge. I'm quite passionate about there should be some things where learners can determine what they want to do. So I, I think that's the, the, the kind of definitions I think we need to be really clear on. And I think now is the opportunity um, for those who maybe are not, have not pursued a self-directed learning agenda and approach to really press in on this one now, because I think many senior leaders are really now open to you know, employees having far more say in how things happening, and that that really affects learning. Well, one of the things you've you've, you've said before in 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 conversation with you and I have had some some of the stuff that's in the book is is that not all learners are quite ready yep. to be self directed at this stage, and they need help, they need support for that because uh, uh, something that you've said elsewhere is is that that learners don't necessarily transfer the way that they approach how they develop skills outside of work to to the way they yeah. develop skills in work. So so what are what are the steps that learners are going through, what are the stages that they're going through and and how do we help them move towards that self-directed approach? Yeah, and I think it's a really important thing you've said there that there is this kind of two sides to this. That if, in fact, going going back about a year or so, we were in a, a large organisation, and some senior leaders were sort of saying, "Oh, I'm not sure we're ready for podcasts and all this kind of stuff," you know, whatever. But you talk to them about what they do when they get home, and one guy said, "Yeah, well, I'm cooking when I'm cooking my meal, I'm listening to to podcasts." So we've got it as learning professionals i think we need to help people to understand this holistic approach to learning and what maybe you do in your personal life is totally relatable to what we do and that you know that's audio books all those those kind of things mm -hmm. I, I think for me one of the really helpful things was gerald gerald gross um stage self-directed learning model um so if you've not come across this across this gerald grow and this really helped me in my thinking around this and very quickly four stages that that grow promotes in terms of moving people towards a more self-directed learning approach stage one dependent learners and this is where a lot of organizations are um you know as a dependent learner you're reliant on the on the instructor you're reliant on the organization to tell us what we need to do how we're going to do it and that's a very common place and i think we've got to understand that within organizations there's huge muscle memory that many people see themselves as dependent learners there's this classic thing have you know what learning have you been undertaking well i haven't because i haven't been on a course so that's that's kind of st stage one grow then goes on to give some really clear tips as to how we can move towards more self-directed stage two he talks about interested learners and this is where we build some accountability in um, for learners to be involved in engagement in aligning learning to their personal needs rather than just generic goals and for that we can look at things that they're interested in things which are very um, current for them things which are very relatable to their role so it's almost like we begin to tempt learners to be uh, more more involved with that that kind of interest in their own learning journeys and that's a definite step for us stage three talks about involved learners this is something where it gets really exciting this is when we involve learners in the design process we um, help learners to be part of how we shape shape learning and decision making and you know i come from a product design background i mean it's crazy you would never design a product in a product design thing without involving consumers in that design process so this is where as learning professionals in stage three we can really begin to involve that learner um, involvement and experience in there and stage four grow then says we get to the stage where um, we have self-directed learnings, which is where folks can really take some responsibility for their learning. And the role of the learning professional changes massively in this. We become um, resources. We become coach mentors. We become supporters of line managers um, to enable the resources and the infrastructure to be in place for people to have their own unique journey. And, uh, and, and for me, it is a bit like a slalom ski course. There might be some specific gates which the organization want us to go through but the route between those there's all manner of things we can do so it is that without doubt that gerald grow model has helped me to think about moving from a dependent learner situation to having really quite you know fully self-directed learners within organizations and and it, and it feels 
to me, I think the grow model is a great, the, the Joe Grow's model is a great one in, in that it actually talks uh, about almost a continuum. So yep. at one end, yep. you've got these folk over here, and at this end, you've got those people there. And, and we're kind of moving them through those stages. And the point that you're making there about interested learners is, is really resonates with me because, you know, ask people what it is that really hacks them off at work that they find you know, really kind of difficult and and tricky. And, you know, when somebody says, can you do the kind of groan inwardly and say, oh, I hate having to do that bit of my job. You know, so so that there is there is a you know we're answering very uh, clearly this this what's in it for me because yeah. you know I'm, I'm getting that bugbear off me, but but what else is it that we do as L and D people to to help people move? Because I th I think organisations act as though they have dependent learners in yep, in some agreed. cases. I think that's one of the challenges. I think you've already said that individuals sometimes revert to that role because that feels comfortable and keeps them from taking much responsibility for their capability. So so how is it that as as L and D teams within organizations, as those advising organizations, how how do we help them to progress towards this model where people are self-directed and then once they've got there, what the heck do we do with it? Yeah, I think there's some practical things we can do. And and this is about a change of role for us. And I think this is really encouraging because you talk to most learning professionals, they don't want to be in this kind of, you know, dictated to this, you know, create a course on GDPR, just picking one thing out, for instance, you know, we, we know how it works. So I think there is a change. I, I think there's a, some practical things we could do. One, I think we've got to help learn a mindset on this one and we've already said that many people in their personal lives are doing this stuff naturally that it's just what they're doing so i think there's some stuff we can do around that building self-awareness about how we learn um and you know maybe to give great examples i mean things like learning at work week are just brilliant um you know we, i'm really get behind that because there's all sorts of creative ways of just people saying what have they learned you know so certainly at cipd we often do what we learned this week i mean it's, it's just a great question to do so i think mindset is really important and to that point i think the whole thing around this is going back to my early teaching lecturing days metacognition is an interesting one getting people to think about how they think and um if we think about john uh, flavel who kind of was the, the the brains behind this some really helpful stuff around helping learners to plan monitor adapt and evaluate their learning those are the kind of stages around this so i think helping people to really think about planning learning and i yeah, I put a checklist in the book, which, you know, obviously folks are, are willing to grab that. But I think we need to support learners. And to some extent, we're now becoming kind of learner coaches, learner consultants ar around this. And I think the other thing I probably would, would say, Robin, is it, it's about learning buffets, not fixed menus, you know. It's been a very, very limited fare often within organizations, but we recognize there are so many ways that we can learn, um, so many resources. So I think for us as learning professionals, it's now about pointing and directing. And, you know, we go back a few years and we, we were talking about learning concierges, which I quite like that term. You know, you're in a hotel, you don't know where's a good restaurant and the concierge is able to find out and direct you. And I think as learning professionals, that's more of our role now is to resource and support and particularly line manage you know those are the, the folks close to the workplace who we need to support in terms of staff actually di having direction and control over their learning and I, I think that role of the line manager is, is crucial if you've got a self-directed learner it can be for some line managers just a world of pain and, and challenge and, and difficulty whereas for others who are more able to embrace that and to 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 act as a curator or a signposter or someone who who acts as that concierge i think that gives them a, a greater role and a greater capability to support the team's capability so the l d consultancy role and you write a lot about that in the book it is not just to the organization at a kind of organizational level but is also to those line managers, yeah. the, the, the kind of team leaders and, and the people who are responsible for the output of people. And it's also now, particularly in where you've got that access or that's you're capable of providing that, to those learners themselves to help them to think differently about what it is that they need to do in order to learn and develop their skills and capabilities. Yeah, what an interesting triad that is, organisation, manager and learner. I mean, that's a really, you know, and that 
that triangle has been skewed for many years, hasn't it? That the organisation has taken the priority on that one. You know, I, I think for this is such a brilliant opportunity for us as as learning professionals. I think taking an interest in line managers is crucial. I'm not talking about just a generic management development program. Actually supporting line managers to be brilliant at what they do. They are the biggest advocates for learning. They are the ones who support um, needs analysis. They're the ones who know what needs to happen on the ground. They're the ones who are championing what we're doing. They're the ones who make time for this. So I think um, if if anything now in organisations, we should be really focusing on supporting line managers with great resources uh, around that. And I think consulting to learners is great. Okay, folks might say in huge organisations, how do you do that? Well, look, there are there are ways of getting alongside um, individual, you know, learning communities are just brilliant ways of us getting alongside a range of individuals to support them. So I think our emphasis has changed. I, I welcome that. I think it's a brilliant opportunity for us to balance that triangle of, of, of responsibility and to put more emphasis on supporting managers and learners in their learning journeys. Andy Lancaster, thank you very much indeed, because I think that's been a terrific conversation and some real uh, things to think about for myself and I hope the people watching Learning Now TV. Cheers. Great to chat, Robin. Bye. Thank you. Well, in the blink of an eye, we're done for January 2023. The amazing show, really great insights. I have my pen and paper out. Nigel, what stood out for you? Or what, where were you taking notes? Well, I think two big things. The first was just the practical insights from Jo Cook. She is a bundle of knowledge in that, in that frame. And everything she says is really insightful and based on years and years of practice. So she's the true practitioner expert, and we'd be foolish not to listen to her words of wisdom. And I loved Vikesh Joss's ability to span the globe when talking about ed tech. I think it's really important that uh, we, we have that kind of perspective. And he's someone who's been there, seen it, you know, chewed the gum. He's been there since the very beginning. And his words of wisdom were also incredibly insightful, very different from the practical insights of Joe, but very much world spanning uh, overview, which we also need to get in our heads. So at both ends of the spectrum, we need to understand what's going on and then be able to present it a lot better than we mostly do. What about you, Kate? Well, I just think it's interesting to take stock at the start of the year. You know, there is a lot of uncertainty around. And, you know, we talked about it a little bit before we started pressing record. But, you know, there's, you know, there's been layoffs and people are questioning what's happening with the economy and, and, and some of this the, these kinds of things. But, you know, when you get, move past that and start to think about what, right, what really needs to be done here, you know, there are there's so much opportunity still yeah. um, for learning. And you're right, you know, we have to get the strategy right, but we have to get the tactics and ex execution right. So hopefully that's what we're, we're bringing people every month is that cross-section, um, you know, and if there is anything that you particularly want to see on the show or you'd like to come and talk to us you know just drop us a line because we'd love to hear from you especially as you know i think we move into another period of change we've got to keep rolling with the punches yeah i completely agree with you i also think that this is the year when a lot of uh, senior executives in companies will be waking up to the power of knowledge sharing and the power of learning so there will be huge opportunities uh, and it's up to L D to step up you know, they, some will do it, and I think some won't. Right, well, what's coming up, Kate? Tell us about events that are on the horizon. 
yeah obviously you know we we remain in the in the world of uh, face-to-face events which is exciting so our good friends at the linen performance institute have their annual awards on the 16th of february always a highlight of the calendar uh the 28th of feb there's a world of learning exhibition at london olympia uh, which i think it must be a new date for them um in april um i'll be off to las vegas for unleash america so those of you on uh, on that side of the pond uh stay tuned for more details on that uh 3rd and 4th of May is Learning Technologies, now in its new time slot. Um, and 7th to the 9th of June is the CIPD Festival of Work in London. Excellent. Four, five really great events for your diaries. And another date for your diary is the 23rd of February, because on the 23rd of February, we will be back with the February show. Until then, from all of us at LNTV, stay safe. Enjoy this weird and wacky world that we live in and the very best to everybody. And if you're in the UK, stay warm. It's freezing. (laughs) Indeed.